Hello Eastside family, and welcome to another Sunday service. At Eastside, we are all about seeking Christ, serving the community together, teaching others, and joining in worship. This morning, we're going to be hearing about where we place our trust and the foundations upon which we've built our faith. So Lauren and I are going to sing a song, Give Us Clean Hands, and then we'll sing Cornerstone, or My Hope is Built on Nothing Less, as we think about those foundations. And to end our worship time today, we have a video that Proscaneo is going to be sharing with us to help us reflect on the places that we've placed our trust. So if you could stand with us this morning, we're going to begin by reciting Psalm 67 with some of our elders. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Psalm 67. i 
darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. And Tempesta. 
Hey Eastside, it's good to be with you again for our weekly worship video. Before I get started with the message, I have just a couple of announcements. The first announcement is one that's worth celebrating. Uh, I got an email just a couple hours ago. I'm recording on a Thursday. Uh, got an email just a couple of hours ago that the closing is finalized and Eastside now owns the building at 1061 South High. I, I am so excited. We are fired up because we get to move forward with where we think God has called us. And so we're like, I'm just ecstatic about that. And the second uh, announcement is about the next couple of weeks. We're going to be utilizing that space, even if we're not inside yet. Uh, next week, three, or uh, I'm sorry, this week, uh, this weekend, the, the 14th of March, uh, we're going to be having a prayer service at 314. And the reason that we're doing that is because 314, March 14th, is Eastside's 11th anniversary. So we're going to meet at 314 in the afternoon and have a time of prayer. On the 21st, the following week, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, we, we, we stuck to a, a normal time there. 4 o'clock, there's going to be a baptism service outside at the building. And then uh, and a couple weeks after that, Good Friday, we're going to have our Good Friday, I think that's April 2nd, we're going to have our Good Friday service outside at the building as well. So we're excited about all of that. We can't wait to see what God does next. We can't wait to get in that building and begin worshiping and gathering and doing things there. Uh, maybe distance, uh, socially distance at first, but we're, that's that's our home, and we're going we're gonna to continue doing the things that God has called us to do, utilizing that space. Uh, so we're excited about that. This morning, we're continuing, or this afternoon, or whatever time it is when you're watching this. I'm so confused because it's afternoon. Yeah, we're, uh, we're continuing this sermon series in the meantime. In the meantime, and, and today we're going to look at a passage that talks about the end. As I was, as I was thinking about this passage for the past couple weeks, and thinking about what today is. Uh, if you're watching this on Sunday, this is Eastside's anniversary. We, we've been a congregation for 11 years. That's something to celebrate. We, it, it's, a, it's a chance to be grateful for God's goodness, be grateful for His provision, be grateful for the ways that He's continued to provide. It's a chance to remember who we're called to be. We're called to seek Christ to serve the community together, to teach others, and to join in worship. And we are going to join in different ways now. And it's, it's this opportunity to remember that we want to be radically Christ-centered in all that we do. Everything that we do, we're going to measure it against the Jesus that we know from Scripture. I'm also reminded this week that I believe it was the 13th of March a year ago that everything shut down. So I think the 13th was the first day that schools were closed. And so while we are celebrating the anniversary of Eastside, I'm also very aware that we've been <laughs> locked up for a year. We've been, we've been quarantined for a year. And along with that, this past year, there comes a lot of pain, a lot of loss, a lot of isolation, and even depression for some of us. And so it's just this chance to recognize all of the things that, that have happened, that all of the things that today marks. The video that Proscaneo, that you just saw from Proscaneo, there's a tower and we build our lives around all these things and, and some event comes along and it all just comes crashing down. And this past year reminds me of that. So what I want to do right now is just to take a moment to stop and pray to begin because, uh, because we want to take all of these things, the joys and the celebration, but also the pain and the loss and just lay it before Jesus and say, look, Jesus, you know, but we're giving you all these things and we want you to do with it what you will. The, the joys increase the joy, point us back to you and the pain Lord, teach us something through it and, and point us back to you. So would you join me in prayer? Lord God, as we uh, look at your word again this morning and as we gather, even though it's online this morning and this afternoon or, or whenever it is, Lord, as we gather, we recognize that we're celebrating our anniversary as a congregation. 
as a church family, as the body of Christ. And God, we couldn't be more uh, grateful. We couldn't be more excited. We couldn't be more uh, joyful about the way that you've provided and cared for us and moved us over the past 11 years. And God, we look forward to the next 11 and beyond. And God, we also recognize that this, this weekend marks the anniversary of uh, <laughs> the season of COVID. And God, we are tired. We are weary. We are ready to be done with it. And so, Jesus, we just lay that before you. Your word says we can come boldly before your throne of grace. We lay that before you, uh, knowing that we, we, can't, we can't fix it. Jesus, would you teach us again what it means to trust in you? Would you teach us again what it means to rely upon you? Would, it, would you teach us again what it means to, to fix our eyes on you, Jesus? And as we experience that pain and we get to name it, name the things that hurt, Lord, we, we, we trust that you are with us, that you'll never leave us or forsake us. And you can do something even in our pain. And so we're grateful for who you are and what you've done. Lord, as, we, as I speak this morning from your word, I pray that you would guide our time together. We ask all these things in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and our King. Amen. I think the passage that we're looking at this morning is relevant to both of those anniversaries. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 24. Uh, in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 24, it might, the title might say end times. It might say signs of the end of the age. Uh, the late Eugene Peterson in the message, he titled this section routine history. And I love that. He's making a theological statement. He's making an interpretive statement about what we find in Matthew chapter 24. Because a lot of times we look at what Jesus says is going to happen and we want to find a timeline. We want to find, we want to know when and where. We want to know all the details. And Jesus himself says, I don't know when this is going to be. But what we can take from it is some encouragement. What we can take from it is Jesus uh, giving us more teaching, telling us about more about himself. Uh, it's a little like the book of Revelation. When it's used to encourage those who are experiencing trouble, when it's, when it's used to uplift and, and help and point us back to Jesus, it's so, so valuable. But when it's used to predict and when it's used to try to, to, try to find specific details and answers, it becomes very damaging. And so uh, Pastor Peter assigned me this text to look at, and he initially gave me verses 1 through 35 of Matthew chapter 24. That's a lot. I'm going to be looking at Matthew 1 through 14. And the reason that I'm looking at the first section is because 15 through 29, uh, Jesus is explaining what's going to happen specifically in Jerusalem. And then the, the last couple of verses, 30 through 35, are about his return, and I'll touch on those. But we're going to look specifically at verses 1 through 14. So, the Bible is a unified story that points us to Jesus. And so because of that, because Jesus is the place we want our attention focused, we stand in recognition that all of this points us to Jesus. So wherever you're at, if you're able, would you please stand and follow along as I read the scripture this morning. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? <laughs> Jesus answered, as he so often does, watch out that no one deceives you. Uh, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets 
will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Lord Jesus, teach us more about you and your kingdom. In your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. So what captures you? What captures your heart? What captures your focus? What captures your attention? I, I was stopped this week as, or, or last week as I started studying this, this text. I, like I just stopped dead in my tracks after reading verse 1 because it says, Jesus left the temple and was walking away. Jesus, remember two weeks ago we talked about Jesus' critique of the temple. He turns over tables and then he, he's critiquing religion that is, is devoid of him. He's teaching that religion that is, that is heartless and, and just uh, filling obligation, that's dead religion. And he, he points the attention back to himself. So he, Jesus has literally turned from the temple and he's now walking away from it. And it's then that the disciples say, hey, Jesus, this temple still has our attention. This temple still has captured our imagination. And Jesus, I wonder what the look on his face was. But the question for us is what captures your heart? Is it Jesus' vision for us, or is it what we find impressive? Is it what God has called us to, or is what we're used to and what, where we feel comfortable? You see, we have a tendency as human beings, and you see it play out all throughout Scripture, in the Old Testament for sure, and in ways in the New Testament as well. We have a tendency to turn back and, and want to look back at the things that have captured our attention, have captured our hearts. I think of Lot's wife looking back at Sodom and Gomorrah. I think of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the way that they, they went back, both ethically and the things that they did, but also geographically, God called them to a place and they kept getting stopped along the way because something else captured their attention. I think of the people of Israel. I mean, they went through the Red Sea and the waters had no more than closed back up. And they look at Moses and be like, yo, we would be better off back there, enslaved. But you've got us out here in the wilderness. I think of the people. God said, I'll be your king. Look to me. And they're like, <laughs> they look around and see all the other nations with a king. And they're like, you know what? That looks pretty good. I think of Jonah who went and preached in Nineveh. And they repented and turned to God. And Jonah sat down and he said, you know what? I'm kind of ticked, God. And the alternative is going back to the fish, right? Like we turn back all the time. Other things capture our attention. And the disciples say, Jesus, isn't this amazing? And it was an impressive structure, the temple. But Jesus, Jesus tells them, you know what? This isn't about a temple. It's about me as the Messiah. See the very first words of the Gospel of Matthew this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the King, the one who is to come. It's always been about Him. He is the one that is impressive, not the temple. See, our idols, the things that capture our attention, they've all got to come down. Jesus said every one of these stones will be torn down. Every stone will be torn down. You see, every desire that we have that isn't Jesus, everything that we look to to fulfill us that isn't Jesus is a misplaced desire. And here's the thing about misplaced desires. They're always in competition with each other. Whether it's inside my own heart and the things that I want within me or the things that I desire and the things that you desire, our misplaced desires are always in competition with each other. And so Jesus says nation is going to rise against nation and there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Why are there wars and rumors of war? Why are there nations raging against each other? Because we have competing misplaced desires. 
And sure enough, that happens a few years after Jesus' life on earth. Rome comes in and sacks Jerusalem, and it's bloody and horrific. And that's what Jesus is describing in the second half of this passage in verses 15 through 29. The Jewish historian Josephus said there were 1.1 million people killed in that war. 97,000 people were taken and enslaved as a result of that war. You see, our desires are in direct competition with each other. And so, whether it's the temple and your religious practice, whether it's some ideology that you have, whether it's some other thing that you want, our desires are always in competition with each other. And Jesus says, they've all got to go. Every stone will be thrown down. I want to talk a little bit about the end because it's a theme that runs throughout this passage. But the disciples come and they say, hey, Jesus, tell us, when is this end going to be? And it's the word telos. And it appears four times in the passage in verse 3, 6, 13, and 14. They want to know the end. And Jesus starts describing when the end will come, except they want to know an exact time. And Jesus starts telling them about all the bad things that are going to happen before they get there. And then Jesus says, but if you stand till the end, if you stand not on your, uh, not on your religious practice, not on your ideology, not on the thing that makes you comfortable, not on your desires, but if you stand on Jesus, right? It's why Jesus calls himself a stumbling block, because you're either going to trip over it on your way to some other thing, or you're going to stand on it. And Jesus says, if you stand firm on faith, allegiance to me, then you will be saved. And I love this. Jesus goes on and he says, all of these things that are happening before the end, they're the beginning of birth pains. It's such, a, it's such an interesting analogy, right? I've never experienced birth pains. Uh, I was a birth pain, I'm told, but I've never experienced them. I've witnessed them. And here's the thing about birth pains. You're like, it's this mix of things, right? You're excited because you know the end, the the goal, the telos, the outcome. And so you're excited about what's coming. But there's a lot of pain that you have to go through before you get there. And isn't that the perfect illustration of the Christian life? We, (laughs) We know that we are no longer enslaved, the writer of Hebrews says, to our fear of death because we know the end, we know the goal, we know the outcome. But we're still here in a world that is, is rebellious to the king. We're still in a world that is experiencing the pain of, of a world broken by sin. And so there's some pain that we have to go through first. Jesus said, watch out that no one deceives you. <laughs> I love the disciples' question was when? Jesus says, Watch out that no one deceives you. He doesn't answer the question. He answers the question always in an indirect way, but in a way that is so much better than the questions that we're asking. Jesus is brilliant. Watch out, Jesus says, because many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. You see, around the time of Jesus, there were people that claimed that they were the Messiah. And we've had that happen throughout history, routine history since the time of Jesus. People either claiming to be Messiah or things that we looked to to save us. But Jesus said that it's going to be in His name. This is a theme that runs throughout Matthew. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, On the last day at the end, there's going to be people that come to me and they, they will say to me, Didn't we do miracles didn't we cast out demons, Jesus? Didn't we, didn't we do preach the gospel in your name? And Jesus said, and I'll say on that day, go away. I never knew you. You see, because it's about Jesus' character and quality, right? Christ likeness, the image of God, that's what accompanies the impressive things. You see, Jesus, Jesus said, right? I, I only do what the ideology dictates that I do. I only do what my religious practice says that I should do. I only do... Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father 
doing. He said, what he's saying is, I keep my eyes on God's vision for me and his kingdom and not what I want, not my misplaced desires, not the things, the, the new idea that I'm jumping on this week, the new idea that's like Jesus said, I do what I see the Father doing. And so Christ likeness means that we do what the Father is doing, what we see Jesus doing. That's Christ likeness. And so Yes, there's other things that we might look to to save us, but do they have Jesus' character and His quality? Not just, are they, not just are they effective, are they effective and they're like Jesus. That's what we're after. Jesus goes on and He says, then you'll be handed over to be persecuted. And that word is thlipsis. It's such a, uh, an interesting word, this word thlipsis. You'll be persecuted, you will experience this pressure and you'll be put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me. That's the English translation. In Greek, it's actually Jesus is saying, because of my name. Again, he says name. So first, thlipsis, it means, uh, it means literally pressure or squeezing or constricting, confining, a, a narrowing. And what Jesus is saying is you're going to experience some of those things and you're going to be, you're going to experience hardship as you go, right? Routine history. You're going to experience these things. Flipsis has, has this ability to refine us. It has this ability to purify us. It has this ability to, to slough off, to, to get rid of the things that aren't essential. When Jesus talks about a narrow gate, he's not talking about the fact that just a few people can go in. Jesus is talking about it. He's talking about it as a very specific way of following him. The specificity of it is, is Jesus' name, his character and quality, what he's like. And so, you know, there's a lot of times when we as Christians have kind of this, uh, we have this tendency to be like, oh, they're just against us because we're Christians. They're, this is what persecution is. Mm. No, if you're a jerk, people will treat you like you're a jerk. If you're mean uh, and aren't worried about justice, people are like, mm, that doesn't seem to fit Jesus' character and quality because he's concerned about those things. So to be in Jesus, what Jesus is saying is that the, the persecution that you're going to experience when it's valid, when it does something, see, Thlipsis produces something. And when it's when it's being persecuted for Jesus' name, his character, and his quality, it will produce something in us. It's not just persecution because we're, we're unkind. It's, it's persecution, it's pressure because we're living out what Jesus called us to live out. His character and his quality. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians says that Flipsis produces something. You see, when we do this in Jesus' character and His quality, it produces something in us that you're not going to be able to find anywhere else. And that thing that it produces in you is Christ-likeness. It's the image of God being uh, formed in us. That's what Thlipsis does. When we act in Jesus' character and quality, it produces more of Jesus character and quality. And that's how we can stand when we experience those difficult things. And Jesus says there's going to be a lot of dropouts. There's going to be a lot of dropouts. Many are going to turn away from the faith and the love of most will grow cold. And the reasons for dropping out are because there is pressure and because like legitimately there is evil at work in the world and people are going to look around and, and be like, you know what? I cannot, I don't want to keep up this uh, routine of following Jesus. It seems too difficult. And there's going to be some that, that look at the evil around, look at our hypocrisy and they say, you know what? That's not for me. It's why it's so important to act in Jesus character and quality and not after our own desires. And so people are going to drop out. There's going to be wars and nation is going to fight against nation and there's going to be earthquakes and famines. And all of that, Jesus says, is routine. It's going to continue happening. 
It's the beginning of the birth pains. Jesus says, stand. Not on the thing, not on the, not on the, the external thing. Stand on Jesus who will form you internally, who will form you from the inside out and literally change who we are as people so that we look more like him. He won't take away your personality. He won't take away uh, your, who you are as a person. What he does is he makes you more human because we are created in his image through him and for him. Colossians says. You know, we live in a, we live in a, a culture that like it is the popular thing to deconstruct faith right now. And what Jesus is saying is, is true. We see it all around us. People are being like, uh, looking at the way that they grew up, looking at the lives that, that they, uh, the things that they were taught and the lives that they lived. And they're like, this is not for me. I need to move on. But we're also the first society in the history of human beings to live without an overarching authority. Our society is the first one to say, no, I am the final authority as an individual. The problem with all of that is when I am the authority as an individual, all that does is put my desires in competition with your desires. And so what we have to do is recognize that Jesus tells us to stand on him, not on what we want, not on I don't do what, as a believer in Jesus, as a follower of Jesus, as, as someone who follows the way Acts calls it, I don't do what I want with my finances. I don't do what I want with my body. I don't do what I want with my religious practice. I don't do what I want with my faith. I do what Jesus wants because he's the king and he's the Lord and he has my best in mind. And when I follow him, he turns, he, he turns me into something that more closely resembles him. That's the goal. So we have 13 verses of dark, right? We have 13 verses of bad things happening, and then we get to verse 14. Then we get to literally the good news. Jesus said in this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Jesus, he's telling us, listen, he's telling us lots of bad things are going to happen all throughout history that starts as soon as Jesus is crucified and continues right on throughout history. Even before that, like we, we do bad things as people to each other, and it's just going to continue to repeat itself. And Jesus says, but here's the thing, the good news, the kingdom of God is going to be preached. And the good news, look, Jesus doesn't say the good news of my crucifixion. He doesn't say the good news of my resurrection. He doesn't say the good news of my return, though it includes that. He says the good news of the kingdom, because we're living as citizens of the kingdom who are following after Jesus. He reminds the disciples of mission you know what, you can leave that building, the temple behind, because your miss, mission is to know me, Jesus, and make me known in the world. So we have 13 verses of bad news, and then Jesus reminds us of the good news, and he reminds us of our purpose, and he reminds us what we're doing, and he reminds us what we're about. You see, nothing else gets us to the end except Jesus, because that's where it's going. There's a, it's interesting, this passage has been used in a bunch of different ways throughout history. One of the things that people have done with this verse, because it, it says, Jesus says the gospel is going to be preached in the whole world and then the end will come. And so people have looked at this verse and they're like, all right, as soon as everybody hears the message of, the, of Jesus, as soon as, as soon as we tell the gospel to every person, that's it. That's when the end is. That's when Jesus is coming back. As soon as the last person hears, that's when Jesus is coming I don't think that's the heart of what Jesus is getting at. What Jesus is getting at is that we're to live as citizens of the kingdom. And yes, take it to the whole world. And it says all, uh, in English there, it's nations, it's ethnicities. All ethnicities together 
need to hear about it. But it's about us being aligned with King Jesus, not about like making sure that the numbers are covered, right? It's never been about that for Jesus. It's been about making his kingdom known. And, and those who would join in and participate align themselves with the king. It's about alignment with King Jesus. That's the end. And lastly, I want to touch on this because it's, it comes after verse 14, but I want, to, I want to touch on Jesus' return because I think it's helpful and I think it's important. Even so, Jesus said, when you see all these things, you'll know that it's near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. And the, and the big takeaway from this, I think, that, that uh, is helpful for us, it's encouraging to us, we, because we don't have a when, right? We don't have an answer to specifically when this is going to happen. We tend to worry. And Jesus is saying, listen, you don't need to hurry, but there's also no need to delay. The mission is, like, preach the good news of the kingdom of God. But when he returns, it will be apparent. It's not going to be a secret. We're not going to have to be wandering around wondering, huh, I wonder if Jesus came back yesterday. That's not, what the, that's not what this is about. And so Jesus is te- reassuring us, look, my return, you'll know, it's okay. In the meantime, in the meantime, what are we to be about? We're to be about aligning ourselves with Jesus and preaching the good news of this kingdom where there's people who have aligned themselves with Jesus and they want to act in his character and his quality and they're depending on his spirit to change the things that aren't in alignment with his character and quality, transforming it and renewing it and making it more like him because that's good news. That's what gets us to the end. Jesus said this generation won't pass away, and people have wondered about what that means. Uh, Matthew has already used this word, generation. At the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, he gives the genealogy of Jesus, and then, and then Matthew writes that there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, and 14 generations from David to the exile, and then there's 14 generations from the exile to Jesus. And if you go back and read the Old Testament, and if you're going back looking for for specifics and and looking for the literal generations, uh, the the line of genealogy, you'll find out pretty quickly that, you know what, Matthew fudged the numbers a little bit. There's not 14. And so what he's saying, one of the things that we don't understand when we read Scripture that, that Jewish people would understand is that Jewish people, there's, there's always symbolism associated with numbers. Like three to us means three. Four is four. And like we don't have the symbolism with the numbers that Jewish people would. But there's symbolism in this. And, and, and Matthew is trying to communicate something to us. What is he trying to communicate? Surely this generation, this literal generation, or no, surely this this routine history will not pass away. The things that we experience, it's the beginning. And there's something to look forward to, but there's pain that has to be experienced before we get there. This generation will not pass away. And one of the problems, one, one last thing about this, we, we're, we're so, uh, we are so compartmentalized. We divide all these things up into thin slices so we can wrap our heads around them. Jesus comes to the earth as a human being, the incarnation. So that's what we celebrate at Advent and Christmas. And then, and then there's the crucifixion, Good Friday and the crucifixion, and, and we remember Jesus' death. And then uh, we remember his resurrection. And then we think about his ascension being seated at the right hand of the Father and the Spirit indwells us. And we think about Pentecost interceding for us. And and his return is yet another event. Very good commentary that I was reading this week reminds us that like, we look at these things and there's a bunch of events, but Jesus inaugurating the kingdom and renewing and restoring and redeeming all of creation is one event. And pieces of that event are separated in, in what we know as time only because God is merciful and he wants people to come to him to, to repent from their way of thinking and be, be shaped by who Jesus is and what he's like and what he's done. And so this is God's mercy. 
And so the question for us then becomes not like, when does Jesus return? But the question becomes, do you have enough? Do you have enough of whatever it is that you need to get to the end? And the answer, family, is we have enough. In Jesus, we have enough. So wars, earthquakes, famine, whatever, COVID, whatever it is, we have enough in Jesus. And the question that we need to be asking isn't when, but do I have enough? And if I do have enough in Jesus, then I begin, it changes the questions I ask. It changes the way that I think. It changes the way that I approach the difficulty that I encounter. So I want to end today with just a couple questions and, and then a statement. But first, like as we think about, it's been a year, right? It's been a year of COVID, this difficulty that, that not only we, but the whole world I mean, think about it, that the whole world has experienced this. But God would want us to know that He has not abandoned us. He is right here with us. So in the midst of the difficulty, are you going to seek out something that is your desired end, or are you going to seek out Jesus' vision for you in the midst of it? And if you're seeking out Jesus' vision for you, that means that the question we should ask ourselves are, what routines, what habits, what practices am I going to put in place or have I put in place so that my attention is turned back to Jesus? And so I would ask you, what habits, what routines, what practices over the past year have you established in your life to turn your attention back to Jesus? And you know what? I'm not here to lay a guilt trip. If you haven't, there's no time like the present. What practices can you put in place to turn your attention back to Jesus? What routines can you put in place to turn your attention back to Jesus? The other thing that we can take away from this passage is that we can be encouraged in the face of evil. We can be encouraged in the face of horrific events and know that even in the midst of all those things, Authentic Jesus likeness, being created in his image, being more like Jesus, his character and his quality. That's the goal. That's the end. That's the telos. And so it's cliche, but we can simply ask, what would Jesus do? Not because that's what saves us. Hear me. We're not earning our salvation. What would Jesus do when we ask that question? Because the goal, the end for all of us is Christ likeness. And so it's imperative, it is important that we ask, what would Jesus do in a situation like this? And lastly, family, judgment, when Jesus removes the thing from his kingdom that take away attention from him, judgment is coming and new creation is coming. Just as God hovered over the chaotic waters, the Spirit of God hovered over the chaotic waters in creation, so too, any chaos that's at work in our lives, God is hovering over that, ready to speak new life into it, ready to speak to it and give it, uh, give it form and give it substance and give it order. That's what God is doing. He's renewing and recreating in and through His kingdom, which means in and through us because of the work of Jesus and our following after Him. And so, you can rest and I don't mean take a nap. Like, that's, that is good. That is a gift of God's graciousness. And I might just go take a nap as soon as I'm done recording this. But I mean like rest. Like, I know that nothing is missing and nothing is broken. In spite of all the junk I see going on around me in Christ, nothing is missing and nothing is broken. I have enough. And so I can... I can rest. I can rest in Jesus because he is enough and he's given me enough. When will the end come? I don't know. After the birth pains, right? Jesus said, I don't know when I'm coming. The point is not that we know when. The point is that we know the end. And the end is for all of us to reflect the character and quality of Jesus. Isad, I love you guys. I'm excited to celebrate 
at a new building in the near future. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. We'll see you soon. Jesus.